Blood clots form the pathophysiological basis of a few common and often serious diseases in medicine. These include myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, critical limb ischemia, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, to name a few. A blood clot can be accurately referred to as either a thrombus or a thromboembolism. A thrombus is a blood clot that has formed and remains fixed at the site in the blood vessel, whereas a thromboembolism detaches from the original site of formation and migrates leading to an occlusion elsewhere in the circulation. Deep vein thrombosis is an example of a thrombus which can potentially embolize and lodge elsewhere in the circulation, such as the lungs, where it becomes a pulmonary embolus. We typically use two groups of drugs to prevent and treat thromboembolic diseases, and these groups are antiplatelet drugs and anticoagulant drugs. Antiplatelets include drugs such as aspirin and clopidogrel, whereas anticoagulants include three main subgroups, which are warfarin, heparins, and non-vitamin K oral antagonists such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dibigatran. Now the hemodynamics of arteries and veins differ mainly in terms of the pressure inside them and the shearing forces, and this accounts for why the kinds of thromboemboli that form in arteries and veins differ. Typically, thrombi which form in arteries are made up largely of platelets and are referred to histologically as white thrombi. In arteries, these thrombi typically form on the surface of atherosclerotic plaques, and this is referred to as atherothrombotic disease. Atherosclerotic plaques don't really occur in veins because of the low pressure, and so the major factor in venous thrombosis is simply stagnation of blood, or venous stasis. And we know this because it makes up part of Verkhoff's triad of thrombosis. In veins, then, the thrombus is not made largely of platelets, but instead usually consists of a fibrin mesh compacted with red blood cells, and so it is histologically described as a red thrombus. Because these two types of thrombi are composed of largely different materials, the drugs we use to treat them differ. MI, ischemic stroke and peripheral arterial disease, are examples of atherothrombotic disease, and so the clots that th cause these diseases are made up mainly of platelets, and so antiplatelets have found to be the most effective treatment in preventing these diseases. In DVT and PE, however, anticoagulants are found to be more effective, because Anticoagulants inhibit aspects of the clotting cascade, and the clotting cascade results in the production of fibrin, which is the main component of these clots. It is important to note that stroke prevention is one anomaly to this rule, in that we prevent stroke using both antiplatelets and anticoagulants, depending on the cause. This is because strokes can be caused by atherothrombosis in the cerebral arteries, or be caused by emboli that form elsewhere in the body and end up in the cerebral arteries, leading to occlusion, ischemia and stroke. The most common cause of embolic stroke is atrial fibrillation, where blood in the atria becomes stagnant, leading to thrombus formation. If this thrombus destabilizes and embolizes, it can be forced by the heart up into the cerebral arteries, leading to stroke. So in patients with atrial fibrillation, we use anticoagulants because the main reason for clotting in these patients is again due to the stasis of blood, rather than atherothrombotic disease. So how does aspirin act as an antiplatelet? Aspirin inhibits an enzyme called cyclooxygenase. Phospholipids are the main components of cell membranes. One of the products of their breakdown is a fatty acid called arachidonic acid. This is used to make loads of different useful molecules, and one enzyme that is used to convert arachidonic acid is called cyclooxygenase. There are two main slice variants of this enzyme. Cyclooxygenase 1 is responsible for producing prostaglandins that help to maintain the gastric mucosa by stimulating mucus production and by helping to maintain renal perfusion. COX-1 also produces thromboxane A2, which is important in the activation of platelets, helping blood to clot. COX-2 produces prostaglandins which promote inflammation and peripheral pain sensitization. Aspirin irreversibly inhibits cyclooxygenase. So you can see that by inhibiting COX-2, larger doses of aspirin have traditionally been used as an anti-inflammatory and analgesic. However, aspirin is actually much more selective for COX-1. This means it causes gastric irritation, isn't great for the kidneys, and can increase bleeding by preventing blood clot formation. This gives aspirin some bad side effects, which means it has gradually fell out of favour as an analgesic and anti-inflammatory, as other medications such as NSAIDs are thought to be more selective for COX-2, giving them more effective anti-inflammatory properties with a similar side effect profile to aspirin. 
Another side effect to quickly mention at this point is the fact that aspirin can possibly induce bronchospasm, and this is because arachidonic acid is also a precursor to molecules called leukotrienes, which are pro-inflammatory cytokines that can cause bronchospasm. Aspirin upregulates the production of these, leading to the development of, quote, aspirin-induced asthma. So nowadays, we use aspirin as an antiplatelet, and because aspirin is more selective for COX-1, we can use a smaller dose, typically 75 mg once a day, to inhibit the production of thromboxane A2 and reduce blood clotting. When the lining of a blood vessel is damaged, this exposes collagen and von Willebrand factor, which causes circulating platelets to rush to the site of damage and bind. This binding causes activation of the platelet, which involves a change in shape and the release of granules containing chemicals, one of which is thromboxane A2. Thromboxane A2 causes activation of other platelets, helping to facilitate aggregation of platelets and clot formation. So, thromboxane A2 is made inside platelets by cyclooxygenase 1 and released when the platelet becomes activated. Aspirin irreversibly inhibits cyclooxygenase 1 and therefore the platelet can no longer produce thromboxane A2 and so it is not released by the platelet upon activation. Platelets have an average lifespan of around 7 to 10 days and so antiplatelet effects of aspirin can last up to this long due to its irreversible inhibition of COX-1. Aspirin then ultimately leads to reduced platelet activation and subsequent aggregation of platelets.